few years ago, I started a company that makes household detergents, personal care products, and baby products. We do everything we can to make sure they're healthy and sustainable. And then as far as like innovation goes, you know, we've been working on trying to do a fully biodegradable diaper on my kids. But lately, I've been thinking about another way businesses like mine can affect the planet. It turns out the U.S. corporate sector accounts for more than half of the country's annual greenhouse gas emissions. Most of it comes from energy use, like all the electricity it takes to light, heat, and cool our 18,000 square foot office. Are you guys on the top? In the but I found out that a group of passionate young problem solvers called Climate Core is trying to turn things around. Their job, endless corporate America in the fight against climate change. Each summer, they fan out across the country trying to help companies be more efficient. Even places like this. But is it possible to cut energy use here without turning out the lights? Of all the images that emerged in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy, these are perhaps the most iconic. New York City cast into darkness. In lower Manhattan, the storm surge was 14 feet high, a new record, and a foot higher than it would have been if the sea level wasn't rising, mostly due to climate change. Good morning from New York, I'm Chris Hayes. Over two million people are, are still without power this morning following Hurricane Sandy. And but even this crazy storm couldn't keep the city down for long, or so it seemed. In Manhattan, where I work, the lights were back on in a matter of days. But in some parts of the city, far from the media spotlight, people went without power not for days, but for months. So if you really want to see how climate change will impact cities like New York, you have to go further out to the city's margins. Places like Far Rockaway. To keep the lights on, Donald Lawrence had to jerry-rig the family car. I use it for my dining room, my kitchen, one for each bedroom. I try not to use it all of them at once, just to make sure because you don't want to overload the system and trip it, you know what I mean? It is now January 20th, 25th. And we are still without light. They are still without hot water. Three months after Sandy, over 7,000 people were still without power. Some didn't even have heat during a frigid winter. And for many, that was just the beginning of a cascade of problems. I've covered the Middle East at the New York Times for decades. Lately, I've been digging into the roots of the Arab Spring, and it's led me to something completely unexpected, bread. In Egyptian Arabic, the word for bread is aish. It also means life. And in Egypt, life has been precarious these last few years. When millions of Egyptians took to the streets in 2011, we heard a lot about freedom and justice. But bread? Bread was the first word in one of the most popular chants of the revolution, and I want to know why. 
Trade in politics is one issue, not two issues. Aish wal khayal. Trade is, is our life in Egypt. Ahmed Maher was one of the most important youth leaders in the revolution. And three years earlier, in 2008, when bread shortages helped to spark some of the first demonstrations against Husni Mubarak, Ahmed Maher was one of the organizers. In 2008, the lines like that, it was, you can find hundreds fighting really? to get the bread. Really? Okay. Fighting, literally, fighting, physically like fighting. Place, like the streets like that, and there is no bread inside, and there is no flour inside. Five or, or, or seven persons killed wow. fighting about the bread. Over bread? Yeah, over bread. So if the people can't find bread, they will make a revolution. But why couldn't they find bread? Answering that question would lead me from Cairo all the way to Kansas. are changing the atmosphere in unexpected and in unprecedented ways. And that the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. The atmosphere and ocean have warmed. The amounts of snow and ice have diminished. Sea level has risen and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have... There is no more fire season. We have wildfires all year round. Climate change, extreme weather. Pull up what you will, and our vulnerability to it. The 12 years of drought has left the landscape bone dry. We got any patriots in the crowd? A new scientific report has determined the last decade was the warmest on record. Our world is changing faster and more dramatically than ever before. Every summer, over a hundred business students from top schools are recruited to be part of something called Climate Corps. They have what might seem like an impossible task, not just making corporate America more environmentally friendly, but also saving them lots of money in the process. Climate Corps is the brainchild of the Environmental Defense Fund. The students are deployed to big companies across the country they embed for 10 weeks, scrutinizing how the businesses use energy. Hi, Janice. Nice to meet you. Janice Young will be at Texas Southern University. Yeah, Brendan. Nice to meet you. Hi, Elena. Elena, Brendan. Brendan Edgerton is headed to Office Depot. What's your name? Scott Miller. Scott, nice to meet you, Elena. Scott, we're going to be this summer. Las Vegas. Las Vegas. And Scott Miller will be working with Caesars Entertainment. The major gases are carbon, uh, methane and nitrous oxide. But first, they're off to conservation boot camp. So you take the usage, multiply it by the emissions factor. An intensive week of training teaches them how to apply their business skills toward the goal of sustainability. And then it's off to the trenches. Brendan chose Office Depot because it will be an enormous challenge. Brendan. How you doing? All set up. Good. It's already one of the greenest retail chains in the country. They employ a five-person team dedicated to sustainability and have slashed CO2 emissions by over 43%, saving about 10 million bucks a year. You know, whenever you know I brought something up, they seemed to already have looked at it or it was uh, in the works somehow. But now, Office Depot wants to go even further. They're hoping to become carbon neutral, which would mean the company would no longer be contributing to climate change at all. 
Brendan thinks he can help them get there. Scott's assignment is the crazy one. He's trying to save light and water in the world's capital of excess. When I thought of sustainability, when I thought of energy efficiency, I did not think Caesars or anything in Las Vegas. Mr. Wylick in here. And Janice is starting from square one in the heart of oil country. How you doing? Pretty good. Nice good to morning. See you. Nice to see you. Well, you want to give me like an overview? At an institution that's only just starting to think about sustainability. We were trying to cool this space so much. We were basically cooling Houston. This door is op always open. That door that is always, always open. That door is always open. The door that we came through it's is always, always open. open. Sometimes it just doesn't work that way. So do we have an energy efficiency plan? Kind of. So no energy efficiency upgrades have been done in this Not really. Building. So have there been any energy efficiency upgrades or projects done in here? Nope. I got a lot ahead of me. Far from Manhattan, there is a New York City where almost four million people survive near or below the poverty line. And if you grew up in New York, like I did, you know that the further you go, often, the poorer it gets. An hour and a half by subway from Midtown, Far Rockaway is the last stop on the A train. The Rockaways are a thin strip of land between Jamaica Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. It's a poor community where many are already living on the edge. Even before Sandy, the Lawrences were barely hanging onto their home. Though three of the four adults in the house worked, $1,300 a month in rent wasn't easy. Then Sandy hit. The storm left them without power and heat. But it didn't stop there. What kind of work were you doing? Um, doing sales, uh, independent sales contractor. You had a job too, Latanya? Mm -hmm. Where were you working? I was working in the mall at Queen Center. But I mean, after the storm, the buses stopped running at 5.30, 6 o'clock. So I can't have any shift after 6 o'clock. There's no, there's no way I can. You, could, you literally couldn't get home. I couldn't get home. Donald's wife, Melita, also lost her job. She had been working in a nursing home, but after the storm, all the patients were moved away. Your income is gone. Your income is gone. So the kerosene heater and then to keep the car running for the electricity, like what's that running you? I would estimate it to be um, somewhere around about $150 extra weekly for the gas. Now for the heat, each day it consumes one can of oil, $48 to be exact. $50 a day? Yeah. To keep the place heated? Yeah. yeah. That's about $450 a week you're not spending. You but, but if you guys have $400 a month, $400 a week in mm -hmm. rent and $400 a week in heat and electricity. Right, yeah, no, make, exactly. And so you're making $300 a week. There's right. some way to make the money, the math can't work. Right. What do you think is going to happen? Hmm. I don't know. What I'm thinking is going to be happen. I hope it doesn't happen. What do you think is going to happen? Uh -uh. I think um, we're not going to make it out, and the, the marshal is going to come and put us out. The fact that there are families in New York spending winter without heat or power isn't just outrageous or unfair. It also reveals how unprepared our cities are for the impacts climate change is already having, never mind the future effects. But as bad as things are for the Lawrences, in some ways, they're lucky. At least they still have a home. I can't stay at my house. It's not livable. Diane Allen's family weathered the storm from the rafters of this house. The water rose six feet and left the house unlivable. 
The flood damage and mold are so bad, the walls will have to be knocked down. The entire place gutted. Diane also worked out of her house. So when Sandy washed ashore, she lost not only her home, but her only source of income. For the past month, Diane, her husband, and her five-year-old son, Nashon, have managed to squeeze in with relatives. But that's just temporary, and repairs here will take months. They need to find a place to live. Hi, good morning. My name is Diane Allen. I'm calling from the FEMA hotel list. I'm calling to find out if you have any vacancy with a room that can accommodate three to four people. FEMA and the city are providing hotel rooms to those left homeless by the storm. Now, do you, do you have a waiting list? Okay, so I should call you every day. But with about 6,000 families displaced, mm -hmm. there simply aren't enough to go around. Hi, good morning. I'm calling from the FEMA hotel list. Do you have any vacancy? Not until the 14th. Now, do you have a waiting list? You don't have a waiting list. OK, thank you very much. Have a good day. Oh, my god. Nobody has vacancy. If Diane can't find one, the next stop for her family could be a homeless shelter. Wheat's an amazing crop. You give it just a little bit of water and a half a chance, you can raise some grain. But the one thing you, you can't do is make it rain. Right here, we have wheat that, that was really impacted by the drought. Very, very little grain. There's three kernels in that head. But the other thing is, there's so few of plants. In a foot, there is, what, four or five heads? And in a good field, you'll have four or five heads in an inch, and they might have three times as much grain in them. And that's all drought-related. End of story. I came to Kansas because it's the number one wheat-producing state in America, and because it's one of the places where Egypt gets its wheat. It turns out that Egypt depends on other countries for about half of its wheat supply. Tom Giesel and his brother have spent their entire lives here, and lately, something's changed. And it was like somebody flipped a switch. And it, it, it quit raining, it got warm, and it just stayed that way. How long has that been going on? Three years ago in August is when it turned out here. Mm -hmm. We live in a, in the High Plains, we live in an area of extremes. It can be extremely hot, extremely cold, extremely dry, extremely wet. So people are desensitized to the extremes. It's easy to say, I've seen that. Yeah. But when you see these incremental shifts that move forward, like, you know, the overnight temperatures rise in just a little bit, along with the daytime mm. temperatures. And you've experienced that. Yeah. And that's important, for example, corn pollination because it pollinates, it does a lot of pollination at night when it cools off. Well, if you're not getting these cool temperatures, everything needs a rest, animals, plants, everything. And nighttime affor affords that rest. It, mm. It's cool, it, it, everything just settles down, but we're not cooling off at the nights the way we used to. And also the drought. I mean, it's just flat got dry. It was dry at night, it was dry at day, it was dry in the winter, it was dry in the summer. Last year, we harvested wheat starting in um, May 28th, before, all-time record before was June the 6th. Hmm. Harvest was done in Kansas almost by the time it normally started. It's those changes and those type of things that I see happening that I think are really indicators that, that we're shifting and there's, there's, we're moving. Something structurally changing. Yeah. The United States Department of Agriculture declared this drought the biggest disaster in its 150-year history. But for Egypt, this U.S. drought was just a small part of a much larger trend. In 2010, a series of disasters all across the globe caused wheat prices to double in the months before the revolution. In Canada, the problem was too much water. Record rainfall destroyed a quarter of the wheat crop there. Meanwhile, China's breadbasket experienced its worst drought in 60 years. And in Russia and the Ukraine, drought and the worst heat wave in centuries. For Egypt, this was the biggest blow. 
because Russia is Egypt's number one supplier of wheat. The extreme heat has turned millions of acres of wheat into dust. Today, Prime Minister Vladimir Putin announced a ban on grain exports. It seems crazy that this many disasters could strike in a single year. I want to know what scientists think is going on. Welcome. Welcome Thank to Seasons Entertainment, The Empire. This property is uh, six and a half million square feet. Six and a half million square feet? Of air conditioned space, yeah. Wow. Try to make it as efficient as possible. You know, maintain the guest experience. Sure. Caesars wants to reduce its carbon footprint without scaling back on the luxuries. It sounds like a contradiction. And Scott, who used to work on Wall Street, will need all his business smarts to pull it off. So the Flamingo, actually, this is, this is one where we've had our first test lighting up uh, Donnie and Marie there. So first test didn't go so well. It was a little, we had a little bit of dark patches, and so we oh, set really? that back and we'll, Was that we'll, a technical issue or like with the actual lights or um, is it, can we over, oh, is that what I'm going to be? That's what you'll be figuring on. Got it. Figuring out getting ahead of the game here. <laughs> at, at Flamingo at every single property because we've oh, got wow. them everywhere, so. Over the top lights are just one of Las Vegas's many extravagances. What about the millions of gallons of water spouting into the air? in the middle of a desert. It turns out Scott sees an opportunity there too, something no one else seems to have noticed. Meanwhile, Brendan's idea to help Office Depot become carbon neutral is to use renewable energy, especially solar. Here in Florida, you know, we have a great roof that would be fantastic for solar panels but the electricity rate's pretty low, and there's not any state incentives. And so it makes it still relatively cost prohibitive for a business like this. But even if solar does save money in the long term, there's another hurdle. Office Depot rents many of its buildings. So is it worth investing the money to install solar panels on a building you don't own? Brendan knows it'll be hard to make the numbers work. So he starts looking for other ways to save energy. All right, everybody got a lunch? You guys ready to get started? When you look at a recycling bin... Janice, on the other hand, is starting with something that seems basic, but could actually have a huge impact. She explains that recycling just five aluminum cans saves enough energy to power a laptop for 24 straight hours. And yet Americans throw out more than 30 billion cans every year. And there's a lot of students with an attitude of, I don't care. Like today, you know how many cans of soda I pick on the streets of the campus? As far as recycling, we really don't have very many. Um, okay. We have a recycling bin that's centrally located on campus, okay. but as far as in classrooms, the cafeteria, things of that nature, we don't have anything that can be easily accessed for students, you know, to, to use. Thank you very, very much for being here today, and I'm so excited to work with all of you. I'm really, really excited, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to recycle. <laughs> I said at least twice to recycle. I noticed there were lots, <laughs> lots and lots of aluminum cans and water bottles in the trash can. Janice is discovering that her real challenge is changing how people think. I am interviewing all of the department heads to kind of pilot this energy efficiency project. People are a lot more informed about going green. But the, there's a difference between being informed and actually doing it. So if we get this submetering for the campus, which means that you can track it yourself. And she thinks there's another reason she's meeting resistance. I've even gotten some comments like, you know, this isn't a white school, so good luck with that. That's not going to happen. And I hear that weekly. So that's what's very difficult, is that getting people to see that they can participate and why it's important, but it's how it's not a white issue. Sustainability, climate change, energy efficiency, all those things are a culture or behavior, meaning that people have a tradition of maybe recycling or investing in energy efficiency upgrades, and they see the importance culturally. 
Well, in our case, in terms of Texas Southern University, it's just not the culture. It's, it's, it's not a priority. It's 10 days before Christmas. They're not done. For Diane Allen, weeks of couch surfing has turned into months. It's especially hard on her young son. I don't even know if I should say, welcome to my home, because this is not really my home. She still hasn't found a hotel with room for her family. And now she's just been told it will be three more months before the house she rents is livable again. They said I won't be back here until about March 15th. March 15th is a long way. Everything is done. Nothing. It's so sad to be here. Nothing. This breaks my heart because I'm still out of vacancy till March. Where are my kids supposed to have Christmas? Where are they supposed to enjoy birthdays? Today's my baby's birthday. We should be in here cooking and cutting cake. We shouldn't have to be going through this. It's not our fault and there's no help. When you're living near the poverty line, you feel the effects of a disaster like Sandy more directly than most. Maybe you don't have an emergency fund in your bank account or credit cards to take up the slack. Your friends and family may not have extra room for you when you lose your home. Whatever the case, a storm's effects aren't just a question of science and sea levels. They're also a matter of wealth and privilege. Craig, Craig, you walk like a sumo wrestler? How's a sumo wrestler walk? We often say that the biggest reason to worry about climate change is what it will mean for our kids. But when it comes to my own daughter, I know I don't have to worry as much as some because she's already won the lottery. Simply by being born into a family with resources, she's far better insured against the worst the world has to offer. But many people in Far Rockaway can't count on good fortune and deep pockets. Sometimes they have to scream out loud just to get anyone to notice now you know that, right. that in their neighborhood, the storm isn't over yet. You see, the problem here is that we're, we're only seeing the beginning of climate change. The amount of warming we've seen so far doesn't tell us where it's going to settle down. In 2010, a string of disasters across the globe upended the world's grain supply and fanned the flames of political chaos in Egypt. I'm in Oxford to meet with two climate scientists who've been studying one of these disasters. Great Welcome day. to the observatory. Great to be here. I've never okay. been. You could say that Oxford is one of the birthplaces of climatology. They started the continuous temperature measurements in 1774. So this, in this place, one of the longest continuous temperature records in the world. Those records show that temperatures are rising. And now, Freddie Otto and Miles Allen are using complex computer models to determine if those rising temperatures are increasing the odds of extreme events. Take us through, you know, something like the Russian heat wave, because that heat wave wiped out a whole wheat crop, which also diminished the global wheat production, which raised bread prices, which ended up in a bakery in Cairo with some poor person either having to pay much more for their bread or not getting any at all. What can we say 
about how the climate helped contribute to that chain of events. There's a strong link between rising temperatures and the risk of heat waves. Mm. So we can, we can make a clear case for the risk of that heat wave which occurred in Russia and other heat waves that have occurred around the world being increased as a result of human influence on climate. Take this dice, for example. To demonstrate that risk, they asked me to roll the die and to imagine that six means heat wave. Six. Give me a two, baby. Six. Six. Four. OK, three sixes and a four. Either I'm really lucky or that dice is loaded. That's right. And we can work out how much the dice is loaded. With a computer, you can ask what would the world have been like if we hadn't raised greenhouse gas levels. We get a clear message on heat waves. Big, heavy loading of the dice, a bit like this dice. It doesn't quite come up six every time, but it's a very unambiguous signal. We've loaded the dice We have loaded already the dice in terms of heat waves. Towards heat waves. Interesting. So far, climate change has caused global average temperatures to rise by 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit since the Industrial Revolution, which might seem small, but according to Miles and Freddy's research, that increase made the Russian heat wave three times more likely. We've never done this particular experiment before of taking a huge amount of fossil carbon and dumping it in the atmosphere in the sort of geological equivalent of the blink of an eye. The way we dump CO2 in the atmosphere at the rate we do this now will, in a very short time, have doubled and then doubled again the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So we'll get... And their biggest fear is that things could turn out even worse than their models predict. What really worries me about this is we are going into climate territory, which we've never been in, and we don't have therefore any information about what it'll be like, apart from what we get out of these models. And there's even more frightening news, not just for Egypt, but for the whole world. This is a map of the temperature outlook over the next 85 years. If we don't take aggressive action to cut greenhouse gas emissions, the planet could warm by more than nine degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. And at those temperatures, scientists project that yields for some crops will drop by 25%. How worried should we be? I found out about someone who's made a fortune predicting the rise and fall of commodities like wheat, and he is terrified. Time is really racing, like every week, and I have to make the most of every day, every hour, every person that I meet with. As the summer winds down, the Climate Corps fellows race to find efficiencies and improvements anywhere they can. Scott discovers a big one in the fountains. A tiny weather vane, when placed in the right spot, can detect when it's too windy and automatically lower the height of the fountain to keep the water from blowing away. If applied across hundreds of fountains, the water savings could be substantial. Today, we're going to take a look at the Office Depot Distribution Center, looking at their operations there and overall building energy consumption. One of the more interesting elements of it is the Kiva uh, robotic system. They all speak to each other and they kind of move on a grid. They can see each other, uh, so obviously there's no collisions or anything like that, making it a lot more efficient and quicker of a process. I feel that it, it probably won't be as easy to identify opportunities, but there's always a chance to uh, tighten things up. With 35 million square feet of building space and more than 20 million orders going out the door every year, that's millions of chances to save a little energy. And I don't think we've ever really looked at efficiency of either the motors or you know, the timing. I mean, maybe right. maybe we could turn half these belts off. So Brendan gets to work. These are T8s, 32-watt okay. T8s. To see what he can find. 
start with the furthest. We're actually going to be looking at technology called LED uh, and transitioning another type of lighting fixture called metal halide. This is 1,000 watts. The LED fixture is only 400 watts. It's 60% less energy to achieve the same amount of light. Jesus. It seems like those are more evenly lit on the LED versus the HAD. I totally agree. Not only uh, is this going to dramatically reduce energy consumption, but it also enhanced the, the look of the structure. Each hotel has dozens of these fixtures and literally millions of other kinds of lights. Even more mind-boggling, it's estimated that downtown Las Vegas has 15,000 miles of neon tubes. Imagine if every one of those lights was just a little more efficient. Suddenly, changing a light bulb doesn't seem so trivial. Let me check the rack lighting over here that we had talked about. And then all of these, they're all on plug that cuts off completely at night, so there's no vampire loads. You guys have a lot of stuff installed already, making it real yeah, hard it's, on me. It's kind of... And sometimes, even a company famous for its energy efficiency just needs to turn the lights off when it leaves the room. Are those on occupancy sensor or just on and off? They're just on and off. OK. Mm -hmm. I haven't yeah. seen anyone up there, but probably shouldn't be on. We could head off the worst effects of climate change if American companies started reducing their carbon emissions by just 3% a year. Office Depot is already exceeding that. Now we just need more and more companies to get on board. This is the point where a lot of companies hit a roadblock and turn the other way or sit tight. As the summer draws to a close, it's almost time to present their findings to the people in charge. After more than two months of searching, Diane finally manages to find a hotel room. You should be practicing what you have to say in front of the class tomorrow. You hear me? Hurricane Sandy calls the, what's the word again? Coastal barrier. Coastal barrier to? Come over. Come over and break? No, come over into the street. And come over into the street and Hurricane Sandy destroyed our home in New York. Hi, good, good evening. Could you tell me between where and where your hotel is located? She's about to join the ranks of the more than 3,000 New York City families living in hotels since the storm. We're here. Come on, pumpkin. Hi, we're here. Come on. Let me help you. Come on. Well, it's a beautiful place. It's far, but it's our room. You said, OK, initial at the top, and sign my name at the bottom. Let's go, Nashawn. Let's go, sweetie. Let's go. You can sleep. Okay. This is my room and my moment that I've been waiting for two months. Two months. Sweetie, let's go. 
Come on. Diane feels lucky to be here, but it's still not easy to make a single room in a hotel feel like home. In and out. Put this one on. Okay. Let's go. I don't like how it made that noise. Come on. The hotel provides breakfast for a certain amount of time in the morning from 6 till 10. We're here for that. Lunch, he gets at school. We don't really to worry. We're adults. And then in the evenings, while he's at school, I'll prepare meals at my friend's house and bring it on over. Just no lipstick for you. Have a good day. May the good Lord bless you and keep you safe. I love you. I'll see you this afternoon, OK? Bye. Have a good day. Great. But just as things seem to be looking up, Diane finds out the landlord at her old place in Far Rockaway is raising the rent from $600 to $900 a month, far more than she could possibly afford. Now she has to apply for rental assistance from the city. It's something she didn't need before the storm. Suddenly, it's all starting to feel like too much. I'm here to speak to someone especially when she thinks about the impact it's having on her son. I'm still in the displaced hotel with the Comfort Inn and Suites. What are you telling him about what's going on? Well, the night that we had to come here, he broke down. He broke down because he said that I'm taking him away from his brother. I was taking him away from his friends. It hurt my heart because he don't really understand why we're moving all about. You know, I don't really think he understands the situation. And I try to hold things together. It's, it's easier when you can tell a person that it's going to be OK, when you know that it's going to be OK. And um, how do I know that it's really going to be OK when we're still going through the channels and we don't know what the outcome is? The spiritual drain on these folks who are scratching and clawing and fighting and hanging on by their fingernails, literally hanging on by their fingernails to this dream, this American dream. And at the moment where it seems possible, where they maybe have kept themselves in some sort of tenuous equilibrium, the storm hits. And I just, it's like, what do you want them to do? What do we as a society, what do we want these people to do? And what are we doing to protect them if and when they fall, when there's some natural disaster, which there are going to be many more of in the future, right? What we've seen in the last three years is a persistent pattern of, of bad grain-growing weather. It's just been a statistical fluke unless you believe that climate change is changing the odds, which looks to be much the more reasonable argument. Jeremy Grantham has been called an investment genius. He co-founded GMO, an asset management firm that manages over $100 billion. He's famous for predicting the dot-com bubble of the 90s and the housing bubble that led to the Great Recession. He's also an expert on global commodities like wheat, and that's where he sees signs of something far more dire than the next stock market slide. Well, my job in investing is to think of what are the more important ideas. Climate change, global warming, is probably the single biggest issue that faces our generation and the next generation. So how can you avoid it? You made your clients a lot of money or saved them a lot of money by anticipating bubbles from the dot-com to, to real estate. Is there another bubble right now related to climate? that 
we should be worried about, that you're warning your, your clients about? Unfortunately, it doesn't feel like a bubble because the glorious thing about bubbles is they break and they go away and it goes back to normal. Uh, this is going to do anything but that. It's going to get worse and worse. And so uh, I think of it more as uh, the very foothills of a, of, a, of a major problem. We tend to think of what happened with the Arab Spring in 2010 as an entirely political event, people rising up against dictatorship. But actually around it was a huge climate storm. Why is that so impactful on Egypt? Well, e Egypt has for at least two or three years been my biggest worry. Weed is nearly 30% of their entire calorific intake. It doesn't matter that the Egyptian government pays for it and subsidizes it. They can only feed half of the 80 million they have now uh, themselves. And uh, however much they juggle the funds around, the Egyptian government just simply doesn't have enough money to feed and provide the energy for um, 84 going on 100, going on 140 million people. So all of this is the real backdrop to the Arab Spring. And it's all the backdrop to climate change. So you're saying you've got an incredible cost push and then the weather turns against you. That can be the kind of thing that tips you over the edge. And it may well have done that year. If you have a situation where you're spending 30% of your family income on food and energy, and then in a matter of four or five years, it doubles and triples and quadruples on you, you're likely to be fairly desperate, and desperate people take to the streets. That's exactly what has happened in Egypt, Syria, with its terrible droughts. The most immediate problem on a 20-year horizon is food. We'd have a real food problem without climate change. It's just a most unfortunate element to come in and up the ante even more. I think the biggest risk is that it will destabilize such a series of poorer countries that that in turn destabilizes global politics and that comes home to unsettle the future for the US. This is not a coincidence. We're only a severe drought or two away from the near collapse of Egypt. This is our last best chance. Climate change dominates everything. All the rest is in vain unless you get climate change right. At the end of their 10 weeks, the Climate Corps fellows have to pitch their ideas to the top executives at their companies. How much will the head of a casino care about light bulbs? It's in front of the CEO. It's in front of senior folks at Caesars Entertainment. It's in front of a senior person from the Environmental Defense Fund. I've given presentations before, but I think this is by far the most important presentation of my life. Does climate change only affect those who have the money? We have to think about the broader context. Environmental justice affects us all. So the things that I wanted to explore the most was savings, because that's something we all can benefit from. How can we invest something small that will eventually pay for itself and that will save not only the campus, money, but also help reduce our carbon footprint. The first thing we looked at was daylighting controls in the dining hall. $3,700 in savings just for that. Uh, another element, the dock lamps. Uh, each loading dock has currently an 80-watt incandescent bulb. So looking at just changing them to LEDs, a net present value, almost $8,000. But we estimated for $43,000, over $10,000. $27,000, $41,469,000. All right, there we go. This is a metal highlight. Pros, low cost. Cons, extremely inefficient. Basically, you have 150 of these surrounding the flamingo. If you could pass around this light, uh, this flashlight, 
That is a single LED uh, diode in there. It is very, very powerful. It also lasts a lot longer, 50,000 plus hours for a savings of 81% on energy. And finally, last but not least, we installed a pilot program here at Caesars Palace. If I reduce the speed of a motor that's pushing water by 10%, I reduce my energy consumption by 27%. This solution costs 2,100 bucks. The savings potential is 1.5 million kilowatt hours in Las Vegas per year. Okay, great. Why does it take you to solve this versus the vendor who sells this product convincing us through traditional commercial means that this was a good idea? Especially around here, we've been desperate to find these sorts of innovations. Makes one wonder why we didn't find it. But look, I'm delighted we did. The fact that these efficiencies are not being found is exactly why Scott's here. If Caesars takes his advice, they could save up to $350,000 a year, just off their energy bill. So thank you guys again for being here today. I really, really appreciate it. For Janice, on the other hand, just getting people at TSU to start thinking about energy use feels like an accomplishment. A lot of the things he recommended are going to be implemented on the energy efficiency side. On the renewable side, what Brendan has done is helped us along the way. Brendan's efficiency recommendations could save Office Depot over $6 million a year and slash its greenhouse gas emissions by over 16,000 metric tons annually. Okay. The big fan on it. Okay. I actually priced the thing. Climate Core is just four years old, but if you add up all the energy savings they've helped find, it's like taking a quarter million cars off the road. And far from costing companies money, it's actually saved them more than a billion dollars. In May, after living in a hotel room for more than four months, Diane's family finally moves into a subsidized apartment, far away from the Rockaways. But every so often, she has a reason to go back. Today is the celebration of my grandbaby. We're having a baby shower. Yes, I'm going to be a grandmother. Some people I haven't seen since the storm. Hello, Destiny. Kind of half a hug is done. Congratulations you. on your graduation. You. No Come macaroni. On, After seven months of struggle, Come on, guys. Time to eat. life looks a little more normal for Diane and her family. You said you wanted but they'll never get back what they've lost. The home they knew and loved, the community they were part of. Less vulnerable parts of New York didn't have to face outcomes like this after Sandy. But as sea levels rise and storm surges intensify, the effects will reach further inland and further up the economic ladder. And what happened here in the Rockaways may prove to be just an early glimpse of what climate change has in store for all of us. <laughs> 